All right, let's uh, go ahead and receive our Sunday school class offering right there. Brother, Alan, would you lead the Pastor Beth in the offering? It is good to be back in the house of the Lord with you today. And thank God for all of his goodness and his mercy and his love. He's been so good to us, man, this morning. I thank him this morning and praise him each opportunity I get. It's good to see you with us this morning. If you're a visitor, it's good to have you. Appreciate you being here with us this morning. Um, I, I wish I had something other great just to share with you this morning. And it is great because I preach because God's word is not my subject. Well, it's, it's God's word, it's not mine. But you know what I mean by the expression. thankful to be able to share God's word with you and, and sometimes uh, the, the preacher said we need to be reminded of all the time about what's going on what's going on what's going on and uh, just please uh, depending on what you say keep the gospel moving let's try it now it's on yeah well I had it there and they said it weren't on so I flipped it now I think I must have flipped it off somehow but anyway that doesn't matter if you can hear me that'd be that's great but we're going to go back to Matthew's gospel this morning now I've got a lot of scripture to cover, and I don't typically like to cover as much scripture as I'm going to try to cover today. But it's really all tied together. There's three parables, and Jesus makes a statement plus three parables, and it all ties together. And if you used to do half of it one Sunday, then you missed the other half, you might not get a good picture of it. So I'm going to try to cover it all uh, in one lesson. Keep in mind, this is the final week of Jesus. Um, last week, we went through Sunday and Monday. Uh, um, some people say this is Tuesday when this happens. Some say Wednesday. I'm inclined to believe Tuesday. That's just me. If, if you, uh, like I said, if, if Jesus would have died on Thursday, then this would have been Tuesday. If he died on Friday, this would have been Wednesday. So just anyway, you won't take that. But it's not important which day as much as it happened and what, what he did. Now, you've got to realize the parables he's teaching this morning, um, you know, I don't know where you and I would be if, if Israel had not rejected Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, you, you, we, don't, we don't have an answer to that, preacher. Uh, you say, well, he'd have still died. Well, I don't, I don't know about that. They, re they rejected him. Is why he, he offered in. That's through, uh, and he knew they were going to reject him. He knew they would never accept him. Uh, but in Matthew 21, and I'm going to read verse 42, and then I'm going to back up. I'm going to read tw Matthew 21, 42. And go, this, here, this is a theme of what we're going to be talking about today. In so many words, Matthew 21, 42, we'll read uh, that, that this is... I mean, this is the, the majority. This is what we're talking about today is, is, is Christ being rejected. Um, Mr., there's not a thing that we've been through in life. I know we've all been through uh, different situations in our life, tough times, rejection, despite people, despite we, but Jesus Christ went through all that for you, and he knows how you feel when you face those things yes. in life. I mean, there's nothing that you're going to face that he hasn't been faced in this life, but he overcame it and he beat it, and, and he overcame it, and we can overcome it as well in our life today through him but he's talking to the religious leaders i don't i don't i don't argue bible with people but in my thinking in my thinking the first two parables we're going to talk about is 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 is, is jesus dealing with the jewish people now i'm not telling you we can't apply scripture to us because sure we can but i really think the first two parables we're going to talk about has to do uh has to do with that with, with their, their rejecting him and uh but, but let's read this, then we'll back up a few verses. Go. This is what it's all about right here. Jesus is talking to these same religious leaders, the chief priests and the Pharisees and those people. He says, Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scripture the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head 
of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and marvelous in our eyes. Now, this is a quote from Psalms 118. Uh, I can't remember which verse, maybe 22, but anyway, Psalms 118. It's a, it's a quote from there. It's two verses, I think, in the Old Testament. And it's a, it's a messianic psalm, and it's, and it's quoted. Uh, I don't know all the details, and according to who you read behind, but I'll share a couple of things with you about the stone, and we'll, then we'll, we'll, we'll get into the parables. Um, I, I've been in the building business different types for most of my life, really, of one type or another, whether it be houses or foundations or whatever. Uh, and, and, and we do things different today than they did in this day. But in this day, they laid everything off of a cornerstone. One, cor one corner block was set, and that determined everything about that building, period. When the, built, when the temple was being built in those days, there was a stone that was set to be the cornerstone. And it was rejected from the building from the beginning because the builder said it's absolutely worth nothing. Right. And it was rejected. It, it laid out there for a long time and they tried to build the building. And everything they would do, it failed. Uh, the cornerstone had to be, it had to be one that would, could, could take the heat. In other words, uh, even rock stuff cracked. But, you know, if, if, if the hot weather or cold weather, but if it sits through both and it's strength-wise, it's strong. But this cornerstone was rejected over and over and over. And they looked at it, and they just couldn't think there's anything that could be used out of this stone. But it won't work other than the way God had it planned. Now listen to me. In 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7. Let's turn over there. We'll go to that. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7. And this is talking about the temple of God being built, or uh, Solomon's temple. Did you know that when they built the house, everything was made up? Everybody understands the terminology manufactured. In other words, you buy something manufactured and you get, you don't have to do nothing but just put it together. How many has ever bought something? I mean, I don't care if it's a toy for a youngin or anything. You just, it come all in pieces and you put it together. No beating, no banging. You just put it together. Did you know that's the way God's house was made in the beginning? And you know, it was that they were so sophisticated in those days. There was a quarry, and we'll call it a quarry. I'm just trying to use the terminology you would understand. There was a quarry, and everything there was made at that quarry and, and numbered. So the only thing you had to do when it showed up is just put it together. Now, what does this say? Listen to what this says. And it says, The house, the Mount Solomon's temple, when it was in building, was built of stone made ready before it was brought there. They were made, made ready at the quarry so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor tool of iron heard in the house while it was building. They didn't have to force something in place. That, that's amazing to me. Everything was cut to fit. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't have to cut something off, make it shorter. They didn't have to do what I've had to do, stretch things out and make bigger joints. And I've, I've done all type of stuff in the business to make it work. They didn't have to do that. What God does, God does right. Amen. Now, I told you last week, you know, that God made four temples, or there was four places that God dwelt, and the last one being us. So we ought to be able to take this scripture and apply it. Does God don't make us do anything. He don't have to cut us short. He don't have to make us long. If we, if we do it the way God said do it, everything falls in place. Right. Everything has got a place in our life if we're doing it God's way. Amen. And that's what he's telling in this text. I mean, th th they had rejected this cornerstone, and this went on for months and months, if not a few years. And, they, and that stone, they could see no use for it, no what until they decided to go get it from the field and bring it and lay it in the corner. And Jerry, when they laid it in the corner, it, it, everything come together. They had rejected it. They, they rejected it. And this there, Jesus is saying, they're doing me the same way. This there, there is no other foundation other than in Jesus, period. He is the chief cornerstone. This there, you can try, you can quit this, and you can quit that, and you can go to church, and you can pray, and you can do this. And you can just name all the things you do, but unless Christ is the chief cornerstone in your life, it's going to fail. Amen. It, not only did he say when the winds and the rains come with the fall, with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the house fall, but it would say this. It said, but great was the fall of it. Amen. And that word great, I've told you over and over and over, is megas, which is where we get our word, our English word, mega. You know, just because a storm comes through and tears up a house, that ain't a mega disaster. But when it comes through and it tears up 50, 75% of the houses in there, that's a mega disaster, that's a bigger disaster. 
And he said, he didn't say, he just said, great. What was the fall that lesson? You've got to be built on Christ. I mean, if you don't, you don't can't turn over a new leaf. You can't, you can't right. quit drugs. You can't quit alcohol. You can't quit cussing. You can't quit this. You can't quit that and just think everything's all right. It don't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Jesus has to be the chief cornerstone. And, and don't reject him. That's this whole lesson this morning is on rejecting Christ. They, they worked on the temple and built the temple, but they never did it God's way. And until they did it God's way, nothing fell in place. But once they did, I mean, that's, that's every, you might not be ever done no building. But for just to happen on a building the size of the temple, that's a miracle within itself, not to have to use a tool of iron. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. They weren't, they, they weren't a tool of iron heard in the house. I mean, that's all I can tell you is, is everything was cut out there, and it, it just laid in place. And they got the house built. So, And Jesus is telling these religious leaders, let's go back to Matthew. Back to Matthew uh, 21. Let's see which verse I want to start in. Well, we'll have to back way up probably to 23. Uh, Matthew 21, 23. All right, so when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things, and who gave thee this authority? So they come to Jesus, and I really, they, they, they had to know there was something to Jesus as far as, and this is religious leaders. But they came up and asked him, by what authority do you do these things? Now, Passover was nigh, just days away. But if Jesus would have come out plainly and you know, said, I'm the, now he did tell them in, in a parable, but if he had just come right out and said, hey, I'm the son of God, there's a good possibility they'd have stoned him on the spot. Jesus had to die on a tree. He couldn't have died any other way. Amen. Sin started from a tree. And Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, it says, Cursed is when, when somebody hung on a tree, they was a curse of God. Yeah. He had to become a curse for me and for you. There was no other way. He couldn't be stoned. I mean, they just, that weren't God's plan. God's plan was to be crucified just like he was crucified for my sins and your sins and the sins of the world. Amen. So he had to be crucified. So, so he didn't come right out straight and tell them, but he asked them a question, verse 24. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I'll, I will ask you, ask you one thing, if, which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. In other words, Jesus said, well, i got a question for you. You answer mine, I'll answer yours. Verse 25. The baptism of John, whence was it from? Whence was it, from heaven or men? That's a good question. In other words, John the Baptist was preaching. Now listen, John, don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. John the Baptist didn't preach the cross as in you and I know the cross. Right. Not, not like we know it, not exactly. Now he preached repentance and he also grace and truth coming. It's coming. And he said that. But I don't think he, and, and he also said the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. I understand that. But it never implies anywhere that he knew that he was going to a cross as in you and I know the cross. Right. Uh, he just knew that there was a Messiah coming that was going to change the world. He, knew, he And he preached that. But he must have been anointed by God. He said, so, so it says the baptism where he preached repentance. Turn from where you're at and get, get turned from your wicked ways. Anyway, he says, was it from heaven or was it of men? And they reason money himself, and, and, and we shall, if we shall say from heaven, he will say to us, why did you not then believe? Next verse. But if they shall say of men, we fear the people for all hold John as a prophet. So they, they say, and if they answer yes, he said, well, why didn't you believe him? Why didn't you repent? These religious leaders hadn't, hadn't repented. Now, if you do some study in there, and maybe we'll get that far today, seems like time's moving kind of fast, but um, the harlots and, and, the, and, the, and the sinners is the one that, that really John got to, more so the religious leaders. Now, they come and looked on him. Uh, they looked on him, and sure enough, but they didn't repent and turn from their wicked ways. They didn't do that. Uh, but anyway, if they said, but if we shall say, man, we fear the people for all whole John is a prophet. In other words, they couldn't. John, John the Baptist was a household name. Just, I mean, everybody in Jerusalem knew who John the Baptist was and, 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 and knew he was sent from God, so they couldn't turn against John. So next verse. And they answered, Jesus said unto them, We cannot tell. I, I, you know, we cannot tell. I mean, let's hear it's a yes or no answer. I mean, it, it's not a hundred answers to the question. That, that it's a yes or no answer. And he said to them, neither do I tell you. Well, he cannot tell. He said to them, neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. 
Now, he don't directly tell them, but in parables, he tells them. Again, because they would have got angry and possibly stoned him on the spot, and it weren't quite time for him to die yet. He, this there, not only did Jesus have to die on the tree, as I already said, but he had to die at Passover. Yeah, right. He couldn't die the day before. He couldn't die the day after. I mean, everything's in line, church. He had to die at Passover. And, and, and that's what's leading up to verse 28. Now, he tells the parable of two sons. Now, this is directed to the Jewish people, the whole parable. And my thoughts and my thinking that the whole parable was to the Jewish people. He gives them a parable. He said, but what think ye? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and said, son, go to work today in my vineyard. So a man has two sons. He comes to the first and says, son, I need you to go work today in my vineyard. Next verse. And he answered, I will not. In other words, the son looked at him and said, I'm not going. He was up front. He was honest. He said, I'm just not, I'm more or less, so many words, Dad, I'm not going to do that. But after he repented and went, and listen to that word repent means just what it means to turn around. To, to turn around. In other words, he, he, he said, I'm not going. Now, this, this, was, this was the harlots and the, the sinners and Satan in that day. That, you know, that when they first heard John, they didn't want to go. When they first heard repentance, they wanted to do their own thing. They wanted to go their own way. No doubt, like many of the people in here, we, we've been our own ways. Or we say not today, but let me tell you, today is the day of salvation. Yes. We don't none have a promise of tomorrow. Amen. Work while is day, there comes a night no man of work. Today is the day. Yes. The, today is that day. Uh, and he answered, I will not, but, after, but afterwards, he, in the end, he, they repented, and they went to John, and, and publics, and I couldn't ever get the other word out, harlots and publics, and I couldn't ever get the other word out, just come to me. Um, but they finally come and began to repent one by one. There's no telling how many people repented and changed, and we come back to God through John, through John the Baptist ministry. I mean, repentance. I mean, that, that, that's, right. that's all he has to say, repent and turn to God. Now listen, the harlots and the publicans and all of those sinners, they knew they weren't living in the will of God. They knew that they, they were doing things that God said not do. They had a Bible, they had an Old Testament Bible just like you and I have. They knew it was wrong to kill and to steal and commit adultery and to do the things they were doing. And at first they said no, but then they repented. Thank God that we were able to repent today and, and go the way God would have us go. Next verse. Or he came to the second son and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. Now the one that the one that said he wasn't going didn't show him any respect whatsoever at all. You may not get that out of that text, but I do. But in this text, he was very respectful. He was ready, sir, I'll go. And he went not. Right. That's religious leaders. That, that's the religious leaders of Jesus today. Yeah, I, you know, they, they, they think they just, everything's in the perfect will of God. I've told you over and over and over that they were looking for a Messiah. I, I realize they're still looking for one, but you've got to realize when this time comes that they was, that they was a, a feeling in the air that they, they were expecting a Messiah any day. They knew all that. Listen, that verse I just read you about being rejected out of, or out of the first or not out of, out of is in uh, Psalms 118. Do you not realize they read that at Passover every year? That that ain't a verse that somebody just didn't know. That's kind of like John 3:16 to you. I mean, they, they knew it that well. I mean, why in the world they couldn't see they were rejecting the very Son of God? But they, anybody, you know, I say often, I tell you, Daddy says a blind man can't see. They couldn't see it. But they said, I go, but they went not. They wouldn't, listen, they didn't want to be in a crowd where publicans and harlots were. They thought they were above that. They thought they were better than that. They thought they, they, thought they, they were way, way, way better than that. They wouldn't want to be mixed with the same, with the same people as that uh, in, in those days. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't go. Verse, next verse. Whether the twain did the will of, of his father, they say unto him the first, Jesus says unto them, Verily I say unto you, that public is and harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Ain't that something? Yep. People that think they're religious leaders, they think they got this and they got that, and they just God's gift 
pretty much, and, and, they're, and they're just the greatest. God said the publicans and the harlots was going to go in before them. The lost people. Why? Because the lost people repented, repented. They knew that they were wrong. They knew they had the best. They knew they had made mistakes. And they repented of their sins. And they went to work in the vineyard. And, and these, these religious leaders, the only thing they could do was get angry. Go on to the next verse. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And when you had seen it, repented not, afterward that you might believe him. They seen the change in people's lives. They, they, they seen a difference. I mean, we've, we've all seen, and I, I realize there are some people who's deeper in sin than others. I understand that, but we've seen people we knew got saved. Amen. We know it. Right? We, you know, there is a difference in their life. They can't do that on them by themselves. They can't do that on their own. And, and the people saw that. But they still didn't believe it. I mean, what, I don't want it to take for some people to really believe on Jesus Christ and to really know him. I mean, listen, when you're seeing all what he's doing in, in the people's lives, you know, they still, they still reject. Let's keep going. Next verse. Now it says here another parable. First one was the two sons. And I'm going to cover it quickly now. Here another parable. There was a certain household which planted a vineyard and hedged it around about and digged a wine press in and built a tower and laid it out to husband and went into a far country. I, I really believe it's talking about the father as in God the father in this text. That's what he's referring to. That's what he's telling us. Um, that God came down. Uh, listen, he chose Israel um, according to what I can re remember in the Bible. He didn't choose them because they were the great number. They were the smallest number of all people. Best I can remember is what he told them. But it was God's chosen people, and he chose them. And he, and he done just like this. He give, he, give them a, uh, uh, he give them land. He give them vineyards. He give them all these things and give it to them to work. He said, one day I'll be back. They waiting on the second coming or the fir first coming for them. Our second coming, their first coming. Uh, of the Messiah. Next verse. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husband that they might receive the fruits thereof. 35. And the husband took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. 36. Again, he, he sent other servants more than the first and they did unto them likewise. 37. But last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. Now, this is where it's getting to the point where Jesus in a parable is telling them who he is. Yeah. Now, you've got to realize that all through time, what Jesus has been describing is all these prophets and people through time that's been killed because, because, because they're a prophet, because people didn't want to hear them no more. Or if they stoned some, they beat some. That's happened all through time. I mean, you can go back to the Old Testament and, and see that. But, but last of all, he sent them his son. And, and they were reverence my son. They said, surely, surely, they, they would reverence my son. When he can birth 38. But when the husband saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him. Let us seize on his inheritance. I really thought in their mind if they thought they could kill Jesus, all their problems would go away. Yeah. You, you don't have to see it like that. But I really believe they thought if they killed him, he, his name would die out, and, and in a, a, a year, everybody would forgot who Jesus was. I really think that's what they thought. They didn't realize that, but that's what they were thinking. Come, let, let, let us kill him, and we won't have to worry about him no more. You know, he, he's going to be punished. God's going to get him. God's going to punish him because he's making himself equal with God. I, I really believe they thought those things. And just take everything. In other words, you had John the Baptist. He had died. But you had a lot of people trusting in Jesus that might have been leading out of the Bible. I don't tell you this. I understand. Uh, but there might have been a lot of people that didn't worship in the temple like they once did because they began to follow Christ. There would have been different discussions in the temple now that Jesus has come on the scene. 
the life would have changed for them. Their church life would have changed for them, or temple life, whatever you want to call it. It, it would have changed dramatically with Jesus in the picture. I mean, when you went to church, there'd been people talking about Jesus. Well, you know, they'd have got tired of hearing that. The priest and the chief priest, people over the temple, well, they'd have got tired of hearing about Jesus. They was all about God, but so to speak, but they, they didn't want to hear but they didn't want to hear about Jesus. So if they could kill him, life would be better for him. I really believe, and that's what he's telling me. And, he, and in this text, they know what's coming. Or he knows what's coming. And in his text, he's letting them know in, that he's the son of God in, in a parable. Next verse. And they called him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. One more verse. I'll keep going. 40. When the Lord, therefore, that vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbands? In other words, when the, when the, when the father, when he comes, and he sees what's happened. What's he going to do to the husbandmen? Next verse. They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto the husbandmen, which shall render him fruit in their season. Because they reject him, because they killed him, God did destroy Israel and reject them. In 70 A.D., Titus come in and destroyed and burned down Israel. Burned up the city. Destroyed it. But after the day of Pentecost, before that 70 AD, after the day of Pentecost, you and I were able uh, to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Or the people before us, our ancestors, our people before us began, the Gentiles was able to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life. Jesus done exactly what these men said was going to happen. He, they, they destroyed them. But next verse. All right, that's why I covered that one. Now let's just let's jump to jump to 22 for a few minutes. Chap, chapter 22, verse 1. I, I said I want to tie these three parables together because it's all about rejecting. Jesus did those things. The, Israel was, the city was destroyed because of rejection, because they rejected Jesus Christ. You and I are those new husbandmen that come in, and, and uh, that's a, like a tenant farmer, or, or maybe some of y'all might want to be more familiar with the term sharecroppers, but same, same principle, uh, and that's where you and I are at. Now, in this text, in, in, there, in this text, I think there's three, three invitations, more or less, more or less given. Um, during this time, and and it's a parable of of a marriage. Now again, the king is going to refer to God here because his son's going to be in the picture. So it's, it's a picture of God the Father once again, and 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 this is pretty much going on in the same people more or less that Jesus is talking to. And he says, and Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables. And says, and that's letting us know he's pretty much talking to the same group that he's been telling the parables to. Next verse. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Next verse. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Now you got to realize, I, I'm not big into want to attend big things where important people that I just I, I'm you know kind of not like that but um, you got to realize that in this time frame to be attended a king's wedding was a big thing I mean to say you were invited to go sit down at a wedding of the king or one of the king's children I mean that's that would have been great I mean, it wouldn't be no different than you invited to a president's child or whatever. It's the same principle. Um, I, I know I won't ever be invited to nothing like that. I don't know about the rest of you. Um, but it would have been a big thing to them. I mean, it, most people would, would be so excited to go to an event like this. So it, it was a big thing. And uh, you read behind different people. Different people say different things. Um, but a lot of times, that the, some of the, the most I've read behind that sometimes they say there was two invitations. There was an invitation that went out with a robe. And then the next invitation that come was the actual day of the wedding. Hey, the wedding's going on now. You used to quit what you were doing, put the robe on. You, got, you, you read by different people, they say different things. 
two invitations, some, some say three. But the robe is pretty consistent. To get in, to get into this marriage, to get into this marriage, you, you have to have the right clothing on. Now, I, I can tell you that in this text here, uh, in my thinking, the, the robe they're referred to in this in this scripture to me is, is is righteousness through Jesus Christ, His blood. In my thinking, in this text. Now we talked about the choices with the two sons, and we talked about the land. Now, now we're talking about. The final supper, what we all looking for, the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's what we're looking for. I mean, you've got to be made a choice to follow him. You've got to be repentant and go. And, and in the other testaments, you've got to be working and bearing fruit in, in the second parable. But, and, and if you do those two things, and you've, been a, and you've got the blood of Christ applied to your life, then you're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But you've got to have, you've got to have the robe on to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, and that, that's what it, it's telling us here. All right, verse... Verse 4, maybe it is. So he sent out an invitation, but it wouldn't come. Again, he sent forth other uh, servants, saying, Tell them which were bidden. Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my uh, fattenings are killed, and all things are ready. Come into the marriage. So then he goes again, and he sends out more, and he tells more details about what, what's expected at this marriage, what, what they're going to be eating. Uh, I mean, listen, you got to realize in those days, people didn't eat like that every day. If you study and do some things, you, you'll find out they, that that's not something they did like a lot of us do on a daily basis. They, you know, uh, a lot of times we feast every day, but uh, they didn't do that at special, specific times of the year, different things, that went, occasions that went on. But anyway, he sent forth servants saying, tell them which were bidden. Behold, I'm prepared. I'm ready. I want you to come on. Put your robe on it and come on. Verse 5. But they made light of it and went their way, one to his farm and the other to his merchandise. It's so easy in this life to put everything else in the world before Christ. And I'll be the first to tell you, it's easy. It, it ain't hard. It, it, ain't, it ain't difficult. But we should have a desire to want to serve him. And for his will, and, and, uh, and let our life uh, line up with his will, whatever his will is for our lives. And, and you, and you listen, I say it often, but you, he needs to be first in my life, he needs to be first in your life. I'm just telling you what the Bible says here, they made light of it. Maybe you ain't got to do it that way. Maybe you don't, you don't have to get there that way, there's other ways. I, I'm just saying what it's meaning. They didn't think enough of it. They went to his farm rather than to the marriage. I'm looking forward to the day when I said it, the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to be a great, it's going to be a great, it's going to be a great day. But they made light of it. They, one went to a farm, another went to merchandise. Now, listen here, this parable, in my thinking, it, if you've got, you got a Bible sometimes on the top of it, it'll tell you where this parable is in Scripture. I don't know if you, yours is like that or not. In other words, Another a Bible might say this same parable is in Luke 14. Now, I think it would be two different parables. I mean, you, you don't have to agree it like that. It's okay um, because there's a lot of differences in it. He answered stuff, and then there's a lot of differences. I think it's just a different occasion altogether. I think it's two separate ones, me personally. Because in the other one, it tells them one, you know, one, one had a new wife and one had military, whatever the deal was. I think he told it more than one time because people are making light of it. People still make light of the gospel. People still make light of somebody uh, attending the church or, or wh whatever the case may be. They, they make light of it. They think there's nothing to it. They, they think that it, the only thing you have to do is be good. That one, one day you'll be sitting there anyway. They, they, people just, it's, it's amazing. They, they're, they're, well, the Bible says it best. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Let's put it that way. They really just don't know. They just think they know. Next verse. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. I mean, they began to kill his servants. Next one. Next verse. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. I'm sorry. Next verse.
But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murders and burned up their city. Right back again to Titus, 70 AD, when he came in and destroyed Israel. The invitation started with John the Baptist. And then you had Jesus come along, the same thing, the same invitation, and they wouldn't accept him. And he burned up their city. Next verse, verse 8. Then saith him, he to his servants, the wedding is ready, but they which were bid were not worthy. In my thinking, the nation of Israel. In my thinking, the nation of Israel. They, 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 they just not worthy. Uh, they, they've made light of it. They've done everything they want to do other than what I say do. They're not, they're, it, 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 but, but it's ready. Next verse. Next verse. Go ye therefore in the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid, bid to the marriage. Go out, and, and, and everybody you can find, bring them to the marriage. Next verse. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together as many as they were found, both bad and good. There's two ways to look at that, bad and good. Bad could literally mean bad as you and I think, but not once we're saved. Not once we got on the wedding garment. In other words, all of us were something before we were saved. Well, I, uh, somebody look at First Corinthians while I finish. First Corinthians six, something that says that. You quote it sometimes, preacher. It's, it's in First Corinthians six. You, you'll know what I'm talking about when you get over there. Um, both bad and good, but it could mean also like in the other parable. Um, people that were maimed and blind. See, those people like that were, were prohibited from, from going in certain parts of the temple. If they, they were blind or maimed in any way, they were certain areas. They just could not go in the temple. I mean, and I didn't say that. God said that back in, in the Old Testament. Um, and so it can mean that, or it can literally mean bad. You, you find what I'm talking about yet? Read it for me if you don't mind. Is there another verse there? Yeah, yeah, the next one. And such were some of you. You are washed. Yeah. You are sanctified. You are justified. You pass out the Lord Jesus yeah. by the yeah. Spirit of our God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. See, you you could you could be you could be bad out there and, and, and just a changing of your garment, the, the robe of righteousness, having the blood applied to your life, you're changed immediately. It ain't something that waits months to happen. Uh, I, I realize we may grow in, in, in grace and knowledge and, and things of God every day, but we're changed immediately when, we, when we're washed in the blood Amen. of Jesus Christ. So both bad and good, uh, so to speak, would have, been, would have been brought in, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Next verse. And when the king came in to see the guests, now I think, that, I mean, I think this, is, this is God the Father again because this marriage is for the Son. He saw there a man which had not on a wedding. I don't know of a more sad scripture in the entire Bible than this one. The next one, verse 12. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in here thither not having a wedding garment? Somewhere or another through that man's life, you know, he's made it, he's at the marriage supper, I mean, he's at the table. He hadn't eaten yet, but he's at the table. Maybe, maybe the plates and the fork, I don't know, maybe everything's there with him, but, you know, he's got to realize he's different. He's got to look around and say he's the only one that don't have anything. He, he's got to. Maybe in his mind he's sitting there thinking, I told them they didn't have to do it that way. I was just as good as they were. I told them that there was more than one way to get here. All them other ones, I looked, they went this way, but I come in there. I'm sure the man had those type of thoughts. But it's sad that you can go this far. Yeah, I don't know about you. It's just, to me, it's not a more sad verse of Scripture in the Bible to get to this point. I mean, he's at the wedding, he's at the wedding feast. I mean, it's, it's, 
He's almost there. I mean, when I tell you almost, I mean, that's as close as you'll ever get without getting there. But we all going to stand before Christ or before God one day. Now, this year, I have my faults and my failures, and you hear me say that often, and I do. And, and, and when I make it to the other side, it won't be, he won't look on me, Miss Joanne, and see my righteousness because the only thing he'll see me is faults and failures. But if, I, if you're in Satan, he will see the blood of Christ applied to your heart and your life when he walks through that dining room that day. Hey, if he sees the blood, of, and that's what made all the difference in the world, is having the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your heart. Listen, you're not good enough. I don't care how good you do, that's and right. I'm not telling you you shouldn't try to do good. That's Amen. beside the point. But all is your best. You're a failure. That's right, right. At, your, at your best, I wouldn't trade the best five minutes any one of his life for it. Amen. Because you would die and spend eternity in hell if the blood of Christ is not applied to your heart and to your life. Amen. Don't reject him. Listen, don't think there's another way. Don't think there's an easier way. Don't think there's a way around it because there's one way. And Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and life. And no man no comes man. unto the Father except right. by me. No man. Jesus said, you believe in God, you doeth well, but believe also in me. Yes. He would tell his disciples that. Listen, there's one thing to believe in God, but Jesus Christ is, 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 is what it's all about. That's right. People are rejecting him every day. Pe people are trying to go around him. They're, trying, they're saying there's a better way. Don't listen to it. And I'm sure maybe you're sitting here, maybe you're not. But you've got to be like me. You've got to hear it. I hear it all the time. Well, I'm as good as he is. You know, does he go to your church? He go to your church or whatever. I'm, I'm better than they are. It ain't about being good. It's about having the blood of Christ applied to your heart and to your life. There ain't none of us perfect. There ain't, you know, there ain't none of you, as old saying, got wings on your back, so to speak. But you can have the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your heart and your life. And if you do wrong, you'll know you do wrong. That's right. Amen. If, if I do something wrong, I know I've done wrong. Amen. I don't have to ask Preacher David, hey, Preacher, did I mess up this way? I don't have to do that. I know. Right. And if you, and if you, and if you can live in sin and something that don't bother you, there's just no way you're saved. You need to repent and, and, and get this Amen. robe of righteousness and get the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your heart and your life. It don't make you perfect. I didn't say that. But I, I see my faults. I see my failures. And I repent of my faults and my failures. Amen. And, 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 and ask God to forgive me of my sins and my unrighteousness. Um, there, there's a lot of good things in here in, in, this, in these three, but I wanted to tie them all together. But don't reject him. This whole, everything I talked about this morning is about doing it a different way or rejecting him. He is the only way. That's right. There's one way. No other name under heaven whereby a man must be saved other than by Jesus Christ. That's it. There's no, nothing else. No, no other name. Nowhere. No, you, no, nothing. Man, I would hate to get to this point right here. What did it say this man was? And he was speechless because by, by now he's realized he's guilty. He's, in other words, he had nothing to say because he, he, he knew he needed a wedding garment. He knew that. He had been told him that. He was speech, listen, when do some people get speechless? When they're guilty. You confront somebody about something, and if they ain't guilty, they'll probably come right off and say something. Uh, Jim, but I mean, if they're guilty, they'll be quiet. The first thing they'll do is they'll be quiet and give time to think of what I'm going to say. I mean, it's, it's, that's just true. He was guilty. Man, I wouldn't want to get that far right there. And realize that I've lived my, all my life in vain. I've done it wrong. I didn't do it God's right. way. Don't do it your way this morning, church. Do it, do it the way that he would have you to do it. Again, I go back to 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7. If, if you'll let God mold you and make you in your areas of your life, everything will just fall in place and it'll just lock in place like it's supposed to be. Don't try to, you don't have to force it. You ain't got to cut it and make it long. You, you ain't got to stretch it. You, it'll fall in place if you'll let God mold and make the pieces. And you know, anybody, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, I'm sure I'm over. That clock ain't right, but I think I'm, I think I'm over time, but or about that time. Anybody got a question, or comment? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. What about? Um, Yeah, 
Amen. Yeah, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of no sin. Remission. None. None whatsoever without the shedding of blood. Anybody else? Um, I'm sure I'll pick back up Matthew. I, I don't know if it'll be 22 or 23. I really didn't, to be honest with you, I, I really didn't look that far ahead, but somewhere right along where we just finished up here, I'll pick back up uh, next week with the Lord's next tribute to Caesar. I don't know. Between there and 23, I'll pick back up next week. Any, any, any more questions or comments before we close? All right, may God bless me and love you. Till then.